Uh, today we're going to be discussing uh, GNSS vulnerabilities, uh, also known as uh, GPS system uh, that we all come to rely on every single day. Uh, there's a few different classes of vulnerabilities. Uh, the most common one that we typically uh, see in the news is GPS spoofing. Uh, that's essentially locating somebody in a location or a time other than when, where they actually are. Uh, typically, the news articles uh, and news headlines cover change in location, but change in time is actually uh, a lot more common than attacks that we typically see uh, and can actually lead to a lot more issues in the real world. Uh, then we have obviously have uh, GPS jamming. It's a much simpler attack, and simply what it means is the denial of the ability to receive uh, accurate and consistent GPS signal. Uh, and of course we actually see cyber attacks against the infrastructure that actually broadcasts and retransmit the GNSS signal. Uh, and uh, the rebroadcast of GNSS signal is uh, something that we're going to touch upon in the next few slides. Uh, so quick breakdown. Uh, typically when you talk about GPS, uh, we just talk about the birds, uh, the satellites. Uh, but the ground control tower is a very important element. Uh, without the constant ground correction to the GPS satellites, uh, the, uh, the accuracy would start to degrade. Uh, first, the, uh, the first week or so, uh, you might not even notice the difference. Uh, within two to three weeks, uh, the accuracy could be down to a few hundred feet, uh, then it would drift to miles, and eventually you would lose uh, the ability to accurately calculate your GPS position. Uh, you've seen uh, electronic attacks against the actual ground control systems. Uh, we've seen attempts at people actually trying to control uh, uh, the birds, which are typically controlled by the U.S. Air Force. Uh, in the next few slides, you're going to see some data. Uh, we do run an, uh, a worldwide monitoring network. Uh, the data that we're going to show you is highly sanitized. Uh, we did scrub the data from the most sensitive sensors. I actually pulled it out of my data set. Uh, so if you happen to be one of our clients uh, uh, and uh, confidential facility, your data is not going to be in here. Uh, so this is a rough breakdown of where our sensors are. The grayed out areas uh, either does not have sensors or doesn't have sensors we're going to disclose. Uh, the dark areas, uh, we do have sensors and we do have attacks that we detected. And the red areas is uh, where we have the largest number of attacks. Uh, as you can see, uh, when the slides were taken, we have 799 attacks that were detected within the time window within the United States. Uh, moving over to South Korea, we saw 1,200 active attacks uh, uh, happening in that region. Uh, that's primarily because of uh, some of their neighbors. Uh, not to point fingers, but North Korea and China. <laughs> So what is an attack? What does it look like? Uh, the most typical jamming attack is what we call the sawtooth signal. Uh, this is what a low-end jammer would generate, uh, either this or that. Uh, so you could actually see that this has, this is a clock-controlled radio, uh, where this is, was just oscillator-controlled. Uh, these are the low-end jammers, uh, fairly unsophisticated. Uh, now, this is actually one of my favorite ones. Uh, that's actually a duty cycle radio. What it does is it actually waits for the, for the GPS broadcast uh, from the satellite and it syncs its transmit with the same time as the, G as the broadcast. So it actually allows its own radio to cool down and perfectly jam the GPS signal. So it's actually using the GPS signal to sync its own clock to, uh, to conduct the jamming attack, which is pretty funny because you have a GPS control and GPS jammer. <laughs> uh, so the source for some of our captures. Uh, uh, so that's uh, GSS 200. Uh, the one that uh, was actually hijacked by my company are the GSS 100. Uh, and it's a GPS jamming detector. Uh, as I mentioned, we have a worldwide network of them. Uh, what it does is it has an antenna that measures the time of arrival of the signal, angle of arrival, and the direction of arrival of the signal. Uh, they're placed in stationary locations, they have a network uplink, and what we do is, uh, by us knowing where the GPS satellites are located and the signal that we expect at any given time, we compare it with the signal we're actually receiving. Uh, so we're able to measure RF interference and we're able to detect 
uh, spoofing events because we know where the signal should be coming from and what it should look like. And we measure the differential between that. Now, why is this important? Because when GPS signal gets hijacked, uh, that kind of stuff happens. And that's a US QR 107, uh, one of our most advanced uh, spy drones at the time uh, that was hijacked by Iran. Uh, so the spy electronics on board that plane are very advanced. However, it had, and it had a fairly effective, is that an issue? Thank you. It has a fairly advanced navigation system. However, if the navigation, sorry, if the com uh, command control system was jammed, it would fall back to the GPS system. Uh, so what they run did is they jammed the command control signal uh, from our bunkers in Nevada, and then they broadcast a fake GPS signal telling the drone that it was actually located you know, over its base where it was launched from, and the drone went into auto land mode. Uh, the reason the bottom is covered up is because they got, actually got the elevation for the area wrong, and when it landed, it tore off the landing gear. So, getting back to jamming. We have the RF jamming, which is simple denial of the signal. That's the sawtooth uh, signal that you saw. Uh, you have the L1 signal, L2, uh, and uh, as I mentioned, I love their research of, uh, that uh, can touch upon mass casualty events. You have the L5, which is the safety of life. Uh, if a civilian aircraft was to go in for a landing and is using GPS assist, L5 is the signal it would trust. Uh, it broadcasts at the roughly three times the power of the L1, L2 signal. Uh, it has more reach. It is a more accurate signal. Uh, when you're talking about RF jamming, uh, where this is simple radio uh, jamming. Uh, it's also possible to RF protocol jamming. Uh, you could actually broadcast a signal that looks a lot like the GPS signal, uh, but it actually sends characters of the wrong length, wrong type. Uh, you could broadcast a signal to make uh, one of the signals appear to be less accurate. So for example, if a GPS uh, broadcast uh, is claiming to be, uh, have 14 foot accuracy, you could actually uh, broadcast a signal that would make the accuracy appear to be 50 feet, 200 feet, uh, and uh, obviously more dangerous than for aircraft, you could actually give the aircraft more confidence in the signal. You could take a signal that claims to be 30 foot accurate or, uh, uh, or 10 meter accurate and actually tell it that it has a two centimeter resolution, which is not realistic, but you as a human is not the one that's interpreting that, the signal. Uh, your onboard system is what's interpreting it. And obviously you could uh, place it uh, to be somewhere else. Uh, so, a quick breakdown. Uh, that's what the GPS satellite would look like. Uh, satellite, the uh, GPS satellite network would look like at any given time. Uh, the green dots going down would be updates from the ground control stations, uh, sending a ledger update to the birds in the sky. And the GPS works by trialliteration, uh, meaning your device gets at least three signals from at least three birds or any ground station assists. Uh, the more, signal, the more uh, data points you're receiving, the more accurately you're able to look at yourself on the ground. Uh, this is what your ground uh, reception unit would see. Uh, you have the signal strength from a number of birds, uh, and uh, you have your exact date and time, uh, altitude, uh, signal quality indicator, and the indication of how accurately it can position yourself. Uh, so as you see, it's a 2D fix, meaning it's actually a vehicle GPS and not an airborne unit. This gets really fun because people will do anything the GPS tells them. People will drive down boat ramps. People will actually drive right off the docks. Uh, people will drive deep into the desert over unpaved roads because their GPS tells them in a, in a nice soothing voice, make a left, continue 20 miles. Uh, autonomous uh, airborne platforms will do the same thing. Uh, by spoofing the signal, you can actually locate them at a different uh, grid. Uh, there was an event last year where the military was uh, conducting GPS jamming tests. There was a 500 mile radius, uh, no go zone. Well, it wasn't a no go zone, but it was an area where uh, civilian uh, aircraft were and civilian users were advised that GPS would be unavailable. Uh, the advisories and no time advisories went out over three weeks in advance. Everyone knew the GPS jamming event was going to be in progress. A civilian airliner was still relying on the GPS. Uh, for some reason, the pilot wasn't paying attention. He ended up 20 miles off course, and there was uh, actually an FAA near collision warning that went out because he didn't have GPS signal. It was just not an accurate GPS signal. 
Uh, we do see GPS uh, spoofing happening with ships. Uh, the most common occurrence, we've actually seen this off the coast of uh, Africa, uh, where we do see a lot of pirate activity. Uh, we do see pirates conducting GPS uh, jamming attacks, uh, GPS spoofing attacks, uh, and AAS ship hijacks. Uh, so ships have uh, a system that's built in with, with their radio. It's supposed to prevent collisions. Ship constantly broadcasts uh, using a protocol called APRS, Automatic Position Reporting System. Uh, it's the ship's name, uh, direction, speed of travel, and pirates actually jam those broadcasts so when they attack the ships, the nearby ships don't have an accurate uh, fix on that ship. They have the last known location before jamming occurred. They also uh, hijack the AAS radios of the ships they captured and pretend to be a legitimate vessel so they can get close to the ship before they start their attack. Now, if you're a pirate, uh, you could simply cause a vessel to uh, run into a hazard, and then you could uh, steal the crew, steal the cargo. And if you're a malicious government, uh, you can even steal U.S. sailors. Again, another real unfortunate incident. Uh, the culprit was once again Iran. Uh, the U.S. crew claims the GPS puts them safely in international waters. The Iran claims that the U.S. vessel was within Iran territorial waters. Uh, there's a good chance that Iran was lying, as usual. Uh, however, there is a distinct possibility that there was GPS spoofing happening uh, and that, in fact, both sides uh, are claiming that they were where they were and actually do believe that. Uh, we did quite a bit of research. If you, uh, you saw my Black Hat presentation, uh, we actually went as far as uh, hunting down some of the sources of GPS jamming. So these are some of the... Uh, stats that we gathered. Uh, this was for the United States, uh, Northeast region, uh, California area, uh, as well as an area of, uh, of uh, England around London. Uh, one of my uh, one of the interesting areas is uh, assholes. Uh, we've seen civilians with uh, high power GPS jammers. Uh, some of those jammers are actually not just GPS jammers, but they're also cell phone jammers. They're, they are wideband radios. Uh, it's very common for them to actually have four uh, radios built in on board. So they're uh, typically jamming uh, cell phone, GPS, and Wi-Fi. Uh, in the United States, we do have a number of laws that make it a federal felony uh, to conduct this kind of jamming. Uh, and they do carry consequences, including uh, actually a fairly lengthy prison term uh, and very high fines. Uh, I'm not going to bore you with reading through all of that, but you definitely shouldn't do it. Uh, if you do capture U.S. government attention, uh, you're going to win a date with this gentleman. Uh, he is a federal agent. Uh, he does investigate the sort of stuff. Uh, I do get to work with him closely, unfortunately. <laughs> How easy are they to obtain? Well, very easy. It does ship to the United States, and it costs less than uh, a lot of company lunches. Now this bad boy. This is the kind of stuff that you see military units deploying. Uh, these can actually be mounted as recon pods and helicopters, um, an aircraft that could be dropped in somewhere uh, before an assault. Uh, that is a 320 watt unit, uh, from what I recall. Just one problem. That one is actually also a Chinese jammer that's for sale. Uh, a little bit more expensive, but still fairly affordable. Uh, the price code I got for it was, I believe, either $1,800 in bulk or $2,200 a single unit sample. <laughs> ah, this is car hacking village talk, so going back to cars. The GPS that you have in your vehicle shows you traveling down a, a road. It shows you a nice, neat little line what is is actually a sweet little lie. There's a concept called GPS drift. Uh, if you have a proper GPS that actually maps you uh, on the grid, you'll see that there's a lot of jitter. If you're getting an actual GPS signal, uh, I mentioned accuracy. What you see is a line moving back and forth and actually drawing almost a circle. And that circle is the accuracy of your current GPS position which means if you have a GPS that is plotting you accurately, even though you're traveling in one direction, you, you're gonna see some jitter. So for example, in that case, we had 270 meter accuracy, but in, if you're traveling in open ocean, that's perfectly acceptable, as long as you know that the yoke of the, of the yacht was not moving. Uh, any questions? So what, um, what about how do you, do you have recommendations on what, what should the defendant do to GPS externalities that are available? Uh, so the 
the best defense when not blindly trusting the system, not blindly trusting the GPS, and actually thinking about where your GPS is showing you. If you know that you're supposed to be driving 287, getting onto northbound ramp, and your GPS is telling you to get onto southbound ramp, don't blindly trust your GPS. Uh, there's a few things that the government can actually do to track down the sources of jamming. Uh, so there is, as I mentioned, there are several worldwide networks that do detect GPS jamming but not a lot happens to actually track down the offenders, and it was fairly trivial to do. On an earlier slide, you mentioned protocol attacks and buffer overflows. Can you go into that in any more detail? Uh, yeah, so uh, we actually have seen attacks against the satellite network and against the ground stations. People are actually trying to attack the connected infrastructure uh, that controls the satellite network. Uh, we do see some fairly advanced attacks against the car head units where people are actually creating uh, malicious uh, GPS file updates uh, for vehicles. We've seen a number of attacks against Subarus about two months ago uh, where uh, there were buffer overflows in the head units. People could load it up uh, through USB drive. We see a number of attacks against some of their competitors as well. Can you see any ways to use uh, consumer level hardware to either uh, detect GPS uh, abnormalities uh, or detect and report GPS ab abnormalities? For, say, for example, uh, a cell phone app or something like that. Is that a possibility? Uh, great question. Uh, so by actually having more than one GPS receiver uh, and synchronizing the antennas, or using HackRF, sorry, not HackRF, a blade RF with an array, if you place it up at a known location, at a known angle, you can actually monitor the GPS signals in that area. And as I mentioned, there's the GPS drift. Once the drift either changes significantly or you start getting a perfect signal, uh, that could be a pretty good indicator of an attack. Uh, also, on ground level, uh, if you're working with software-defined radio, GPS looks like background noise. You actually need to use the time, uh, the time signal to go back and pick GPS out of the line noise. Once you start getting a GPS signal that actually comes out outside the range of ambient noise, that's a pretty good indicator of actually a malicious transmitter being nearby. Yes? Can you say anything about jamming and spoofing of GNSS signals other than GPS, like low mass and stuff like that? Uh, I have not done a ton of research about that, uh, primarily because I'm in the United States and I care about the US GPS network. Uh, but we are looking at Neptune systems, uh, et cetera. Uh, primarily, I'm going to be looking at attacks against the Russian systems, primarily because, well, they're an enemy. <laughs> Uh, so there's a number of solutions for that, and I do mean solutions. Uh, so there are Blade RF uh, uh, setups that I've seen that are pretty good at it. Uh, you do need a fairly beefy computer uh, to be able to do that. Uh, a simple uh, Raspberry Pi is not really uh, going to be enough. But with a small Nook, uh, you can make remote nodes that are sufficiently powerful. Uh, the organization I work for actually creates uh, GPS simulators that you could use in your lab for legitimate testing. Uh, they crank out. Uh, roughly double the power of what you would typically see of a GPS cell in the bottom. Uh, if somebody were to get their hands on one and a decent RF amp and the correct antenna, uh, you could definitely create your own little uh, macro environment, hypothetically. Uh, yes, in the back. Well, the map you showed at the beginning was the uh, getting the max 800. What was the time period for that? Uh, that was one week. one week. And that was taken two weeks before my Black Hat slides were due. <laughs> yes. So uh, we have GPS simulators and GPS emulators. Even, so our simulators, what we could do is uh, we typically we'll drive around an area and we'll record the GPS data. And what we could do is we could sync it up with a real-time clock and play it back with the current timestamp. I don't know if we could do it with Galileo, but we could definitely do a playback just as a raw RF. Uh, so I'm familiar with the news articles. Uh, our network is, 
needs a stationary position. We don't have anything on board the ships. Uh, however, some governments, well, many governments have the hardware to do GPS spoofing and GPS jamming, and there are legitimate reasons for doing it. So I have no data at all about that event. So I have exactly the same news articles that you do. Yes? That's an excellent question. Yes, I did forget to uh, touch those points. Uh, we've seen attacks against data centers. Uh, data centers that process financial transactions. Uh, data centers that are known to deal with Bitcoin and crypto ledger. Uh, they typically have GPS antennas on the roof, and they're using it for log consistency. And we see people conducting uh, jamming and spoofing attacks to try and affect financial transactions of stocks, bonds, uh, and, as I mentioned, ledger transactions. Uh, people actually set up hardware or uh, bring vehicles onto the parking lots of those data centers. Uh, any more questions? Yes? How redundant are the, uh, the ground control stations uh, between one location, multiple locations? Uh, there are multiple locations, but the primary one is at Cheyenne Mountain, uh, where the home of U.S. Space Command. So if everything is working correctly, uh, typically uh, that actual Space Command is based there. And we have a number of stations that broadcast the signal. Uh, and we've, some of the attacks we've seen are obviously in more isolated areas where the response times would be slower. What people do is they uh, park their hardware. Uh, so the satellites know where the updates should be coming from and where the ground based stations are. They park their hardware near the legitimate uplink point and they try to, uh, to match the uplink path of the legitimate station. And they try to broadcast a stronger signal or they uh, try and play timing games where they'll point the azimuth and try to track the satellite first before the ground station. Yes? Uh, so there's been talk about uh, in the non-encrypted bus signed a GPS signal, uh, something similar to M code like what the military is doing. Uh, there was supposed to be a rollout in 2014, then 2016, now it's 2018. Uh, I think before we have more UAVs in civilian space, uh, we, are, we need to do something about our trust in the GPS signal. We do need a more reliable the GPS signal that we can trust uh, because the, we are going to see drones in civilian space, we are going to see drone deliveries. Uh, yes, question in the back. This is Space Based Augmentation Program, which the Japanese and the Australians are looking at doing. Does that help um, remove some of the speaking issues, or is that compounding the error with the speaker? Uh, so, using a number of networks actually would help. And the systems you're describing, I do believe they have a ground element just like the Lorentz system did. The ground element uh, gives you a hard point that you can actually control. It gives you a much more RF output than a bird that's hundreds of miles up in the sky. So I actually do like that idea. Some of the specs did call for ground stations like Lauren, but I'm not sure what they're actually going to implement. Uh, right. I do believe I owe the room to the next speaker. Uh, if you want to catch me uh, outside uh, with any more questions, uh, and we're going to be in the car hacking village uh, via a table.